Randy, I'm doing well. Great to join you. And I'm so glad that we get to talk about dads. Like you said, our Heavenly Father, a lot of people are watching our dads. And then we've all had dads and we process that throughout our entire lives. And God wants to bring security, healing, strength. And that's a gift from God. Our Heavenly Father is our healer. And I know dads need hope these days. Yeah, uh, and we all do. Uh, and if if you if you don't understand the if the father thing is a problem for you, hang on, because we're going to talk about the importance of the heavenly father. But we want to talk a little bit about earthly fathers, both being one and having many. Uh, and, and Jesse, you, uh, what was your father situation like for you? My parents, they were married when they were in college, and unfortunately, the divorce happened when I was seven. Mm. They didn't stay together, and they didn't follow Jesus, and I love my dad. I love him today. God's brought a lot of healing in our relationship over the years because I didn't see him much growing up, and then my mother remarried, and my stepdad, who I just called dad, I'm very close with him, he's Jewish, and we've had a good relationship. But it's been kind of a mixture. And in between, there were some boyfriends that I'm still close with one of them today. So, you know, different dads than my coaches were kind of like dads, too. So it was kind of a, a variety pack, but I love all of them sincerely. <laughs> That's, I mean, so there, there you go if you're watching. Jesse's experienced a bit of the gamut. Uh, you know, I was adopted at birth, and so James Robinson is my dad. But when I was 48... Uh, I found my biological father, uh, and we actually buried him this year on Valentine's Day. So it was, it was a real treasure to be able to meet him later in life. But, you know, I, I, I never called him dad. I would acknowledge that he was my biological father, you know, but he didn't, he didn't function as the father for me. James Robinson did. So when I say mom and dad, I'm talking about James and Betty Robinson. And that kind of goes to some of the confusion uh, you know, I mean, Father's Day can be very confusing. It's like, who do I, who do I call? Who do I talk to? You know, is it a coach? Is is it the stepdad? Is it when when you think of the idea of fatherhood, Jesse, what what comes to even comes to mind for you? We're all made in God's image, mm. and when we open up the Bible, we read Father God. Mm. Now, to be a dad's an incredible privilege. And we want to look to our Heavenly Father because a lot of us didn't grow up with the dad maybe that we wanted or we didn't grow up with one dad and we're trying to be the dad we never had. Yeah. And the only way to have security, the only way to have clear direction, the only way to have consistent compassion with your kids is to abide with your Heavenly Father. A father protects, a father provides, a father encourages, a father connects. And I love that beautiful picture of Jesus' baptism and the Father, our Heavenly Father, saying, this is my son whom mm. I love and I'm well pleased. Because being a dad is relational. Being a dad is about being close to your child. And there's a lot of different elements. There's the physical, the intellectual, emotional, relational, spiritual. They're all different components of that important role being a dad. I sometimes step back and think there's a lot of roles I have in life, but there's only one dad to my four children. Mm. And because I'm the only one that can play that role, I know that's very significant. If I was not the pastor at Grace Community Church tomorrow, there would be many candidates. They'd be looking through dozens of resumes. But if you're the only person that can play a role, then that's a role that you wanna rely on your Heavenly Father and be faithful in that role. I, it's just a gift, every child is a gift. And if you're a dad or you play that role mm. as a dad figure in children's lives, just know you get to do that. What an invitation. What an opportunity. Never take that for granted. Yeah, and, you know, we can see in our culture the, the crisis we have amongst men fulfilling that role uh, and the damage that it does. What's the age range of your kids? We have four teenagers right now. It's an active home. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you do. Been, been there, done that. My, we have four uh, we had four and five and a half years, so I mean, it, it was it was chaos for about twenty, a good twenty years. But it, there's peace now. You have something to look forward to, but but treasure the Thank time. You. Let me ask you this though, because when when you know when my first child was born, my oldest daughter was born, it uh, it changed everything. You know, um, it changed the way I saw God. Mm -hmm. Did that happen to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. From the first minute 
our firstborn, Joel, our oldest son, he was screaming, he was crying when he came out of the womb, and the doctors couldn't calm him down. And then I walked over to him, and I said his name. I just said, Joel. And right away, he was calm. He stopped <laughs> fussing. And I thought, he's been listening to my voice for months. Yeah. And one word, you know, our connection together was so powerful in the first minute. And that voice, we need our Heavenly Father's voice. Jesus says, he's the good shepherd. Don't listen to a stranger's voice. Mm. And that connection that happens through the words that we say, that connection happens as I pick him up and hold him. You know, I've been praying about that day for so long, and here he is. And then also a little bit of panic, if I'm honest, when <laughs> Lori and I head home after that first day, and they're letting us go home. And I'm thinking, you're letting us take this child? Like, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> are we really ready for this? So the adventure's on, game on. And I realize I'm going to need God's help at every turn of parenting. And it's such, it's one of the greatest joys in life. And don't minimize the struggle. I mean, that delivery and watching Lori go through that, her sacrifice yeah. and her love. Yeah. So that, you know, my heart is just so grateful to my wife and continually working together as a team and loving our children every day. And it's fresh reliance every day, whether it's the first day and we're taking the child home, or like you said, four teenagers and they all invite their friends because our home is a hub in the neighborhood and yeah. things are being broken in the house and, <laughs> and trying to navigate that. But it's always full of love and truth and it's always closely connected. We're designed to abide with our Heavenly Father. We're also designed to abide and walk closely with our kids and make them a priority, be intentional. And for today, dads, it's countercultural as well. Yeah, unfortunately it is. Let me ask you this. So when you, so with Joel, um, it, did, did you think, ah, maybe I'll keep him, maybe I won't, maybe I'll love him, maybe I won't. And as he's a teenager and he does things, he disobeys. Do you love him any less even when you have to discipline him? I love all of our kids and we adopted one and I've always said I love them all equally. I don't always respond equally because they have different personalities, different needs, but I love them all equally. It is hard. It's much easier for me to encourage and it is to rebuke. But mm -hmm. you look at the dads in the Bible and Eli and David and when they start to get passive and they don't enter into those courageous conversations, they don't have any discipline, don't set any limits, mm -hmm. you don't set a child up for success. Yeah. So part of that is how do we walk through? And we've done that during the teenage years with our kids, probably more than when they were in elementary school. That that seemed a little easier. More physical needs when they're younger, right. but more complex situations as they get older. And also it's helping empower them so they own their faith. Like I grew up in a home where no one was following Jesus, and now our kids are pastor's kids. And yeah. how do they really own their faith in a way that, again, I'm setting them up for success and they have their own relationship with God. Because ultimately, as a dad, I can only do so much. It's going to be their relationship with God that's going to be the key for their entire lives. Yeah, and I love that you, you adopted one. I always told my sisters who were not adopted that, uh, you know, mom and dad chose me, but they were stuck with you. So <laughs> you know, we, we, They love that, we, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we always, oh, that's funny. But, you know, so, so, but the thing is, you know, they call me their brother. I call them my sisters, uh, even though the, the DNA test points to all these other people. And, and I have, again, great relationship. We can have a great relationship there. We, we, we can do both. But the idea of adoption, um, my parents explained to me when I was very young is God's idea. Yes. You know? Uh, yes. and so when we look at scripture, uh, Paul says in Ephesians that he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, mm -hmm. uh, according to the kind intention of his will. Adoption is, is kindness in God's eyes. And then in the opening chapter of John's gospel, John says that as many as received him, Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Uh, the, the idea that we can be, you know, grafted into a family that we weren't necessarily born of flesh and blood into mm -hmm. is, is, is powerful when it's done right in an earthly setting. But when we understand the spiritual implications of that, it, it fills a lot of gaps that the earthly relationships may leave. When you became a Christian coming from a, a divorce situation and then having a, 
a, a stepdad who I, I may fully loved you but was not a believer. What what did you see in that relationship now that you have with this invisible heavenly father who is a perfect mm-hmm. father unlike mm-hmm. everyone here on earth you and i included what yeah. what did what did that do for you yes it fulfilled in a way that no earthly father could mm. and it wasn't on my radar because i was an atheist i went to dartmouth college success on the outside empty on the inside i didn't even know the void was relational but mm. relationships the most important part of life and choosing to follow God and walk closely with God is your most important decision every day. As I became, you know, deeper in my relationship with God and grew, I saw in the scripture, he's a father to the fatherless. Hmm. And God started to heal some of, not only the void, but also the pain. And I forgave my earthly father for the first time for not being around and not seeing him for so many years. I couldn't do that on my own. My heavenly father started to empower me. I realized I wanted to be close with my stepdad. So I said, can I call you dad? And I welcomed him. The vertical and the horizontal are always connected. And when we really taste and see that the Lord is good and the goodness of our heavenly father, we become secure because we know we're in his family. Like you say, adopted. This is intentional. Adoption is a healing story. It's a beautiful story. It also includes sacrifice. To be fully known and fully loved, that's when you have security. And yeah. that's what a father can bring. And our heavenly father knows us beyond anyone else. He loves us beyond anyone else. And that security led me to then authenticity. You can't be authentic if you're not secure. And our deepest security is in our soul. And it's with our heavenly father. When you're accepted, you have peace with God. And you know you belong. You know that God's not going to leave you or forsake you. Maybe you had a dad that was gone, but your heavenly father won't be gone. That relationship becomes the basis of how you treat other people. And because God forgives me, now I can forgive other people. And the basis shifts. Instead of just how I feel or how that person's treated me or what kind of dad I have, now I don't keep going down that road of complaining or I don't keep going down that road of bitterness. Like I can let go of those things. And ultimately, a relationship with our Heavenly Father frees us to be the dad that God's called us to be. And He will teach and guide us. And so that we don't just have to figure it out and put all the pressure on ourselves as a dad. And we can draw close to God. He'll give wisdom, James 1, 5, every time you want wisdom. I know as your kids get older, it's like, is this solicited advice or unsolicited advice? (laughs) With our Heavenly Father, it's like, we want your wisdom, God. And James 1, 5, he will give it generously to those who ask. That's one of my, you know, just common prayers as a dad. How do I walk through this? And I'm not doing it alone. My heavenly father is guiding me. So God works on many levels at the same time. And I think preparing me to be a dad and at the same time, restoring a lot in my relationships with my earthly dads. Yeah. And, you know, I got to say that I couldn't navigate being a halfway decent dad or navigate dealing with my my dads and, you know, the adoption side and the the going knocking on doors cold calling strangers going i I think we might be related i mean there's all sorts of things i could not have navigated those if i wasn't secure you know in the vertical in other words if if i didn't know ultimately that i was a child of god i i just i'm just telling you i I would have been a train wreck and a lot of a lot of people maybe you watching right now uh, you you have tried to fill that that empty dad void, you know, with other things, and you you go down that path. It is never going to satisfy. And like Jesse said, it, it, when it wasn't in, until he became a son of God, a child of God, and God started pouring out the, the, those things into him, you know, th- there was an emptiness. And so, if you're watching today, and you you want to, well, if you don't know God as Father. Let me just mm-hmm. put it that way. Yeah. Let me tell you, that is the beginning of something entirely new and wonderful in your life. If, we, if you want to talk to somebody about it, uh, Jesse, I don't, he, you know, he's, he's probably preparing for his Sunday sermon, <laughs> you know, but, but we have a prayer line. Uh, and and it's, a, it, it, it's a place where people who know God as Father will listen to you, talk to you, lead you into a path where you, you can be what we call born again, 
uh, and call that number. It's 1-800-947-LIFE. The life is 5433, 800-947-5433. You can call at any time. We've always got people there because the greatest thing you can do for yourself is to know God as Father. The greatest thing you can do for your your spouse, for your children, is to know God as Father. And that is the foundation on which you can build all of your relationships. Whether you're a father, a mother, we're all sons and daughters in some way, right? Um, but that, that, if you have not done that, do that. You, you can try the rest, it ain't gonna work. When you do that, you can start and you can understand what, what Jesse and I are really talking about. So that that may that'd be the best gift you could give your, your kids, your parents, your, your spouse, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and well, let me ask you this. Would, what happened between you and your, your Jewish stepdad when you became a Christian? Well, uh, he was a little surprised, <laughs> and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a standing ovation or a big hug, yeah, let's say yeah, that, yeah. but we walked through a lot of things together, and I think we have stayed close over the years, and even when we've had differences, we've stayed close. What's been interesting, now, I have a rabbi that's an uncle, I have you know, a lot of conversations, and I love um, Jews, I love, you know, so much of their faith is my faith, yeah. and Sometimes we even talk about the same Bible here we're reading, and it would really come down to this one thing. They would say, the main difference is that you believe Jesus is the Messiah, and we don't. And I would say, Jesus is Jewish, and what about Isaiah 53, and the Psalms, and we have lots of lively discussions. But ultimately, you can't make anyone follow Jesus And uh, what I'm grateful for is that Jesus loves all of us and he invites all of us to come to him, Jew and Gentile. We're all, you know, God loves all of us. We're all made in God's image and we can all have a relationship with Jesus. And also, it's just like we've been talking about reconciling with dads. You can't force your dad to come back and love you. And so do everything you can do and trust God with the results. With you know my Jewish family, I just simply share my faith, share how God loves them, share about Jesus, and then I'll just trust God with where it goes from there. But we need to stay close as families, even when there's differences. When you choose Jesus, your house will be like a house on the rock, not the sand. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And over the decades, I can tell you there's a big difference between those families that really have Jesus at the center of their homes, And I'm talking about that being primary and the church being supportive in terms of discipling your kids, training your kids in the Lord, home is primary. There's a big difference between that and the ones that just kind of by lip service or name say they're Christian, and then the ones who don't have God. And a lot of times, Randy, being real, it comes down to conflict resolution, and it comes down to a gentle answer, turning away wrath. It comes down to forgiving. It comes down to apologizing. It comes down to praying together. And when you really honor Jesus and have him the Lord of your house, then he's going to lead you into green pastures and still waters. And he's going to be able to have that peace and unity that you want. If you don't have Jesus, you just can't fake or manufacture that. And Mm -hmm. I'm encouraging people today, don't settle for the outside veneer or the form of religion, but not really having the relationship. And it's always good to come back to God. It's always good to invite Jesus in. And it's okay, even with kids, when you blow it, you say, you know what? I got off track. Jesus wasn't my priority. It was my job, or it was my hobby, or it was a lot of parents are developing kids for athletics. And I was a pro soccer player, but they're not developing and training kids spiritually. And we need to step in and be intentional. You know, one other scripture, Deuteronomy chapter six, when you sit down, when you rise, talk about these things with your kids, yeah. help them know the goodness of God and process life and our kids are in public schools. It's like an R-rated movie a lot of times yeah. in those public schools during the day. Well, how do we talk through that at home so they can see the world through God's perspective and biblically and then be able to navigate those situations? And I, I'm just, I could talk about my kids, but you know, one is at a Jesus club at his high school. One's giving out hundreds of bracelets at a public school. So there's a lot you can do at a public school to glorify the Lord. <laughs> no, you're going to, you're going to get in trouble in Seattle doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> Good for it's you. It's a different place. Yeah. Least religious city in America. So oh. we are, we are in a mission field yeah. here. Yes, you are. So I, I asked the question initially because I do want people to know that 
you may not immediately get the support of everybody in, in your family, but you'll get the support of God, and that will that will enable you to navigate even some disagreements, as Jesse has. Mm. Uh, also, interestingly, and I, and I want to put this out there for anybody who's coming from uh, a difficult family circumstance. You know, my dad, James Robinson, his his father was absent most of the time. He was an alcoholic, um, and and he was abusive, violently abusive at times. And, you know, for him, when he made God his his father, because he re- just didn't have a real great example, mm-hmm. he did have a foster dad uh, who was a pastor, and that was an amazing uh, influence, and, and really it, it really changed the course of his life. Uh, pastor, pastor Hale, his wife, my youngest daughter is named after Pastor Hale's wife, so there's, there's some special things there. But nice. if you're coming from a place where... Uh, the idea of father's not a good one, or the 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 home is was a, a train wreck. Through the power of Christ and knowing God as your father, you can say, you know what, that that stops mm-hmm. here. My yeah. my biological father said, well, you know about the Monahan curse, and I just looked at him and said, mm-hmm. every curse has been broken by Christ. I don't know Amen. what you're talking about, but it doesn't Amen. apply to me, you know. And he was kind of joking a little bit, but there were, I mean. You know, there was some, there's some, some, some junk on that side of that family tree. You know, the branches are a little, little twisted at times. Um, and but wherever you're at, you can, you can break the cycle of uh, whatever's gone on in your past. And if you need a little encouragement, I'm going to point you to Jesse's website, jessebradley.org, because he's got some great resources. One of them is this generational hope. Uh, and you know, it, right there it says transform the w- the way you raise your children. That's at jessebradley.org. And then Jesse, you get you're walking uh, your congregation through a, a transformative experience with hope. Tell us a little bit about that because I want to give people a place to to follow up on this. Excellent. I talk to so many dads who aren't sure how to guide at home, spiritual leadership. How do you pray at home? How do you make home a vibrant place in walking with God? And the 28 Days of Hope that we've created in the new website, justchoosehope.org, four different weeks, four different themes. First, hope gifts to receive. God's treasure trust. His greatest gift is his presence, but all of his promises and the hope that God builds from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And Isaiah 40, 31 is the other one. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. So as we choose the Lord, receive from the Lord, then we're going to soar spiritually. You can't give what you don't have. And if you don't receive first, the Christian life starts by receiving, not achieving. So dads start receiving. And that might be a new habit to cultivate. You're going to realize you want to make some one degree shifts. One degree doesn't seem like a lot when you start, but over many years or miles, if you're one degree off, that's a big difference. You know, how do we end up here? We were one degree off. <laughs> yeah, so let's right. make those hope shifts together. And we start to cultivate those habits. And we create videos and devotions each day. And then at the end of 28 days, you're going to be able to continue because now you've been praying together. Now you've been in the word together. And with that new habit, there's new momentum spiritually at home. And ultimately, you're helping your kids be all God's designed them to be. Take the yes that... I want our home to be a place where Jesus is honored and we walk closely with Jesus. That most important decision. It's really intentional. It's a commitment. And then rely on God. None of us can do it in our own strength. And we want to set dads up for success through 28 days of hope and walking through that. Families are doing it now together. Every night, what a rhythm. You know, we started that with our kids early on in life where every night we pray and read scripture And out of all the habits in our home, that is the most valuable place because we process life, we care for each other. And I'm tired a lot of nights. My wife's tired, right? We're exhausted, but no, we've we've gotta do this. And when you start to guard that time in your home, one habit can have a massive impact in terms of the unity together as a family and what you receive, the peace, the shalom of God, shalom in your home. God. (laughs) Peace is also relational. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So as we draw near, that's a promise in Scripture. God will draw near to you. 
And don't be too hard on yourself. If you're not a Bible expert, you don't have to be. You just read some scripture. If you don't feel comfortable praying, you know, you don't have to pray long prayers. It's a short prayer. Other people in your family praying together. And then make a priority going to a local church and being part of a church family because you need more than just your own family. And that on a Sunday, guarding that time, finding a church that loves Jesus, is authentic in the word, when you make those simple decisions and you add that to your schedule as your priority, God's going to start to fill your family with hope. And right now, I'd also add that's countercultural because we have a culture that's going further from God, further from scripture, further from purity. And you need to stop, take a timeout like in sports. The basketball coach says, timeout. We're down by 20 right now. We're going this direction. We're not going with the world. And Jesus is going to be with you every step of that way. And you're never going to look back and regret having your home be a place where you're walking close with Jesus. I love it, man. I appreciate I appreciate the hope you offer, the encouragement you offer. Uh, and so, again, wherever you're at watching, uh, you know, whether it's this you know day before Father's Day weekend, or later, I know a lot of you catch this online much, much later, we always need hope. And the ultimate hope is in that heavenly hope. Father. So uh, be sure to check out the resource, justchoosehope.org. Uh, it looks just like this. You'll see the 28 days of hope, and you can start that any day. Uh, there's no, there's, th- this one doesn't expire. <laughs> this is hope, hope is eternal uh, when it comes from God. So appreciate you, Jesse. Anything you want to add before I let you go? Hope you have a great Father's Day. Thank you so much. Enjoy that time with family. Jesus' hope is indestructible through the resurrection. It's infinite. God's not running out of hope. So reject the narrative of hopelessness right now in the world. Just thank God for being your heavenly father every day. Thank God for your kids and then rely on God because the Holy Spirit, God is going to provide everything you need to be a dad. And even if you have deep wounds, God can heal. And uh, I'm so glad that we connected today, Randy. Thanks for sharing your story. It's inspiring. It's powerful. And just being transparent about what God's done in your life. And uh, love it that you connected with your biological dad, too. That took courage, and God blessed it. Yeah, yeah, he did. But, you know, it it, it took me knowing the Heavenly Father. Uh, and that's true with both situations, you know, because it's a little crazy. I, I'll just warn your kids. It's a little crazy be, being <laughs> the, you know, the, the preacher's kid. Uh, but again, the, the, the faith, uh, you know, that my, my dad gave to me became my own. And, th- and that's really the transformative moment. Uh, and, th- and that just gives us hope. So great, yeah. man. Great encouragement. Appreciate you. Thanks for being here, man. I always enjoy it, Randy. Keep up the great work. Uh, you too, and uh, keep keep spreading the hope. Uh, and you can get a little hope. Go justchoosehope.org. You can go do that right now. Uh, and have a blessed Father's Day. Whatever your situation is, we have a good heavenly Father, and you can know him. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live.